A long train was running at moderate speed over a Wisconsin railroad. Among the passengers was a stout, gentlemanly-looking boy who looked much more than 16, although he had not yet reached that age. On the seat beside him was a large carpet bag, which contained all the clothing he carried with him. As the conductor passed through the car, the boy asked, Are we near Benton? It is the next station. Is that the place to take the stage for Portville? Yes. Can you tell me how far I shall have to ride in the stage? A matter of ten miles or thereabouts. Thank you. The conductor passed on, and the boy began to shake the dust from his coat, and, opening his carpet bag, deposited therein a copy of Harper's Magazine, which he had been reading. I may as well introduce him at once to the reader as Walter Conrad, whose previous adventures have been related in Strong and Steady. For the benefit of such of my present readers as have not read this volume, I will sketch his history in brief. Walter Conrad, then, not quite a year since, had received, when at boarding school, the unexpected intelligence of his father's serious illness. On reaching home, he found his parent dead. Subsequently, he learned that his father had bought shares to the extent of $100,000 in the great Metropolitan Mining Company, and through the failure of this company, had probably lost everything. This intelligence had doubtless hastened his death. Walter was, of course, obliged to leave school, and accepted temporarily an invitation from Mr. Jacob Drummond, of Stapleton, a remote kinsman, to visit him. In extending the invitation, Mr. Drummond was under the illusion that Walter was the heir to a large property. On learning the truth, his manner was changed completely, and Walter, finding himself no longer welcome as a guest, proposed to enter Mr. Drummond's store as a clerk. Being a strong and capable boy, he was readily received on board wages. The board, however, proved to be very poor, and his position was made more disagreeable by Joshua Drummond, three years older than himself, who, finding he could get nothing out of him, took a dislike to him. Walter finally left Mr. Drummond's employ and, led by his love of adventure, accepted an offer to travel as a book agent in Ohio. Here he was successful, though he met with one serious adventure, involving him in some danger but was finally led to abandon the business at the request of Clement Shaw, his father's executor, for the following reason. The head of the great Metropolitan Mining Company, through whom his father had been led to invest his entire fortune in it, was a man named James Wall, a specious and plausible man, through whose mismanagement it was believed it had failed. He was strongly suspected of conspiring to make a fortune out of it at the expense of the other stockholders. He had written to Mr. Shaw, offering the sum of $2,000 for the thousand shares now held by Walter, an offer which the executor did not feel inclined to accept until he knew that it was made in good faith. He, there for a, wrote to Walter to change his name and go on to Portville, the home of Mr. Wall, and there use all his shrewdness to discover what he could of the position of the mining company and Mr. Wall's designs in relation thereto. It may be added that after selling the balance of the estate, Walter was found entitled to $500. He had, besides, cleared $87 net profit on his sales as book agent. Such is Walter's story, though, for the present we shall have to call our hero Gilbert Howard, an assumed name which he had adopted at the executor's suggestion. Lest his real name might excite the suspicions of Mr. Wall and so defeat the purpose of his journey. Walter had scarcely made his preparations to leave the cars when the whistle sounded and the train, gradually slackening its speed, came to a stop. Benton, called the conductor rapidly, half opening the door. I am near my journey's end, thought Walter. Several passengers descended from the train and gathered on the platform. Among them, of course, was our hero. A shabby-looking stage stood just beside the station house. Knowing that it was a ten miles' journey and important to get a comfortable seat, Walter passed through the building and took a seat inside. Several other passengers followed leisurely until the carriage was nearly full. While Walter was wondering how soon they would start, a gentleman 
accompanied by a boy of about Walter's age, approached the driver who was about to take his seat. Didn't you see anything of my carriage, Abner? No, General Wall, said Abner respectfully. I didn't see it anywhere on the road. That is very strange, muttered Mr. Wall discontentedly. I told Henry to drive over for me. Are you sure you might not have passed without seeing it? I'd have seen it if it had been on the road, said Abner with more emphasis than strict adherence to grammatical rules. I suppose we must ride with you then, said Mr. Wall. Can you give us seats inside? The driver came to the door and opening it looked in. There's one seat, he said, your son can ride outside with me. John Wall evidently did not fancy this arrangement. The fact was that it was beginning to sprinkle, and, being nicely dressed, he did not want to get wet. I want to ride inside, he said. I'd like to accommodate you, said the driver, but there's only room for one. I don't see why I haven't as good right to a seat inside as anybody else, said John, in a grumbling tone. John Wall was rather a stout, freckle-faced boy, dressed with some pretension to style and sporting a pair of kid gloves. He secretly considered himself to be unusually good-looking and on the strength of his father's wealth gave himself airs of superiority to which he was not entitled. His manners were decidedly arrogant and overbearing, and he was far from being a favorite in Portville, although a great many things which would not have been excused in another less favored by fortune, were forgiven him on account of his father's wealth. I'd like to stretch the inside of the stage if I could, said Abner good-naturedly, but that ain't easy. You may sit in my lap, John, said his father. I'd rather not, said John sullenly. Then I think you will have to make up your mind to sit with Abner. I ain't going to spoil my clothes, growled the discontented boy. Here is an umbrella for you, said his father. Meanwhile, John had been peering into the coach and espied Walter on the back seat, accustomed to regard his own convenience as a matter of more importance than that of anybody else. He was led to make a very selfish proposal. There's a boy inside, he said. Perhaps he'll get outside and give me his seat. This proposal struck Walter as refreshingly cool, but having a sense of what was due to himself, and always having been in the habit of standing up for his rights, he did not propose to gratify John. Thank you, said he dryly. I'd rather keep my seat. But I don't want to get wet. Nor I, said Walter. I don't see why I haven't as much right to ride inside as he, grumbled John, turning to the driver. So you would, and better, too, if you'd got in first, said Abner rather disgusted at John's selfishness, but I must be starting, so if you're going along with me, you'd better climb up. I'll give you twenty-five cents if you'll give me your seat, said John, making a last appeal to Walter. Thank you, said Walter coldly. I'm not in want of money. Get up without any more fuss, John, said his father impatiently. Very discontentedly, John climbed up to the box and took his seat beside the driver. He felt very angry with our hero for declining to sacrifice his own convenience to him. It appeared to him that, as the son of General Wall, the richest man in Portville, he had a right to the best of everything. Do you know who that boy is? That wouldn't give me his seat, he asked of Abner. Never saw him before, said the driver. Is he going to Portville? Yes, so he told me. Do you know where he is going to stop? No, he didn't tell me. Do you think it's going to rain much? I reckon it will be a smart sprinkle. You'd better take off them kid gloves of yourn if you don't want them spoiled. I don't see why that boy wouldn't give me his seat. He hasn't got on as good clothes as I have, grumbled John. Well, if your clothes are spoiled, your father's got money enough to buy you some new ones, said Abner. That's true, said John, with an air of importance. My father's very rich. I expect you'll be rich, too, some day, said Abner. I expect I shall, said John complacently. I'm going to be a lawyer. All right, said the driver, jocosely. I'll give you all my law business. Oh, I shan't settle down here, said John loftily. I'm going to Detroit or Chicago. I want to be in a big place. 
I reckon you'll be too smart for Portville, said Abner with sly sarcasm. I guess I can do as well as any of the city lawyers, said John. I am reading Caesar already. Who's he? A Latin author. You don't say. You must know a mighty lot. Oh, it ain't hard when you're used to it, said John condescendingly. The rain subsided and John had the satisfaction of saving his clothes from injury, so that he ended the journey in a more amiable frame of mind than could have been anticipated.